Hi, everybody. Nick Blazer here with another interview. Um, real quick, I want to share with you my upcoming live commentary tournaments that I'll be doing. Of course, doing remote commentary on Gibraltar, and then I'll be on site in San Antonio and some of these others. So go check those out and go play those tournaments. But yeah, today I have an interview with one of the few GM Zero level grandmasters, Michihito Kagayama. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, everybody, <laughs> and uh, hi, Nick. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining, man. It's, uh, it's cool to have you on to chat with you. I always enjoy our chats about teaching lessons and books and all that, so I'm, I'm super excited for this. Um, I know, particularly, I'd love to continue a conversation we kind of started in, in Monte Carlo about your goals around your YouTube channel. I know you've been making a lot of content lately, and I think you said you want to get to like some subscriber count. You have a vision for growing backgammon that way. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit more with me about what you're trying to do with that YouTube channel right now. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, YouTube is a pretty strong ma media, and uh, yeah, I see a good potential of it. So. Uh, I want to use YouTube uh, to promote backgammon and uh, to promote myself. Yeah. And to promote uh, everybody, including you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I like that too. So I think you, you had set out some, like, maybe you were going to try to do a video every week or day or something. I, th I feel like I remember you saying a video every day, which sounded completely crazy to me. But so like, what is, what are, what's your goal right now for YouTube? What are you trying to do? Uh, yeah, so, so far I, I publish a video uh, once a week, but, uh, my target is, uh, publishing a video every day. That's what I'm trying to do. Wow. Wow. I mean, I've, um, I've been trying to get a, a schedule with the channel too, trying to figure out how YouTube works and all this. So, so I love having <laughs> these conversations with you. Um, and I've been posting position videos every Monday and Thursday and an interview every Saturday. And so the position videos are like 10 minutes. The interviews are about an hour. Um, and I don't really uh -huh. have to do any editing with it. But that's already like quite a bit to stay ahead of and always have things ready. Um, but I, I record quite a bit of it in advance. But I can't imagine doing something every day. So I'm curious like what your experience has been trying to ramp up to that and stuff. Oh, so you uh, you publish the videos uh, three times a week. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's what I've been doing yeah. for now. Yeah. Wow. So it, it's quite uh, often. Yeah. Yeah. It's already very often, I feel like. <laughs> which is, I'm mm -hmm. saying if I did it every day and said, I don't know how I'd do that. <laughs> right? So, and I think you post kind of longer videos in general too, don't you? Like how long are the videos that you're uh, doing right now? Yeah. Yeah. Mostly uh, my video is... Uh, about uh, much uh, like like uh, I keep talking uh, uh, while playing or after after the match, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, of course, if I post uh, the videos every day, then uh, it will be like yours, yeah. Maybe five times uh, explaining positions and uh, twice uh, match videos, something like that. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, okay, okay. I like that. And I think, um, I mean, your analyses after the UBC matches of positions is always really good and really well organized. And I like how you talk through that. So it seems like that could be a really cool format to do more of. Have you experimented with doing that outside of UBC or only for that so far? Uh, yeah, I can take the materials from uh, uh, all the matches, uh, including mine and... UBC, whatever, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have so many materials in backgammon world. Yeah, it's never-ending, right? And there's always I mean, billions right. of positions possible, so why not? <laughs> so have you been, yeah. um, like, when you record a, a match with someone where you both keep talking about the positions and have a conversation, do you just post that right away, or are you just starting to, like, schedule those out? Uh, I'm not well organized, so <laughs> I just post a video uh, when I can. 
<laughs> oh, very cool. Very cool. Okay, okay. Yeah. I don't know why. I, I'll i tell you how it goes for me. But, but I had it in my head that maybe, like, building a YouTube channel, if there's a schedule to it, that people have, like, more of a expectation of coming back to it or something like that, right? So I've been mm -hmm. experimenting with that. But I don't know. I wonder, too, if it would be better to just post everything and have a lot of videos right away, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but uh, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, it should be uh, well scheduled. Maybe the same time. Yeah. Same posting time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to do that. Yeah. Dan Revere has been doing one video a week on his channel on, like, Wednesdays, and his channel's doing pretty well. Someone just, like... And, I mean, he's not, like... Uh, like a GM zero like yourself, right? <laughs> With many books mm -hmm. behind him. And he's still gotten a pretty good following that way. So I think it's really cool, you know? Um, yeah. So, so of course, everyone knows you for all your books too, which are like very elegantly written. I think people love the, the oh, what am I? I'm blanking on the word for it. The, the rules. What do you call them? The, the principles? What are they called? Oh, uh, proverb. Yes, the proverbs. Everyone loves the proverbs. I couldn't remember what the word was, and and all the names for the positions and everything. It's like become part of the lingo in the backgammon scene. I feel like, which is really cool. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember talking to you about yeah. this too, <laughs> and you were saying that that that's part of your own like learning and teaching style too. Is like having like associations to remember things. Can you tell me more about, about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And especially about the name, uh, I put the, some uh, positions or uh, some point. I, I put the specific name, new name. And uh, uh, I believe uh, they are working pretty well because uh, we, have, uh, we have words uh, to communicate and we have words to think, uh, to have the image recognition. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now, uh, once we have uh, we put a new name on some ideas, positions, then we have better recognition. Yeah, yeah, I agree with yeah. that. It's like forming a pathway, and it's. Uh, I think I've talked with other people about this that when you you come up with a name for a play like Double Tiger or Double Falcon. They also might be plays that people wouldn't tend to consider that now that they have a name, they see them and like consider it, oh, is this a, is this a double tiger situation? Is this a double falcon? And it's like a path into finding a play that they might not have seen otherwise, right? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, those, uh, all those names uh, uh, are working even uh, on me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they, that's they help cool. me. I was wondering that. So before you like wrote any of your books, did you tend to organize your study that way in any way? Did you already have names for positions like that? Uh, actually, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. So, uh, uh, yeah, the features I wrote in my books are all I use over the board. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's so fascinating. I feel like... Everyone would probably, well, I guess this is what your talk, like, keep talking videos are about. They get to hear your inner monologue. But I, I'm sure everyone loves the idea of Michi asking if this is a double tiger position or, like, hearing that voice while they think about positions over the board, too, I bet. Do you get that a lot, that people hear you talking about a double tiger while they're thinking about a play? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Especially when I publish uh, my first book, Opening Concept, uh, I see some people uh, scream double tiger in the tournament room. <laughs> Most recently, I remember hearing people scream, are you ready to roll the dice? Are you, are you sticking with that one? Is that because I, I thought you had some new catchphrases in the UBC this year. So I, I'm curious. Yeah, you, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I'm so used to to say that phrase, yeah, it's very natural to me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. So, how did you get started, like, with writing books? I think um, you written you've written a lot of things in Japanese already, right? And these are just your. Uh, that's. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that's correct. 
actually, uh, in, a, in a quite early stage of my Bakemon career, I wrote uh, my first book in Japanese. Uh -huh. Maybe uh, af uh, after I started playing Bakemon seriously, maybe after after two or three years. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I already wrote one book in Japanese. Yeah. That's really impressive. How so uh, I, I don't know why, but uh, for me, writing was uh, mm, not so difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. That's a good uh, skill to have, of course. And uh, so how long ago did you start playing? Oh, <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, when I was uh, young, I, I, I learned backgammon, but uh, Maybe it was like a uh, uh, fourteen years old. Oh, okay, okay. Because Bakemon is not so popular in Japan, mm. so yeah, it was my first uh, opportunity to play Bakemon, and uh, and uh, no one actually no one knew Bakemon around me at that time. Mm. Okay, okay. Yeah, so so I bought a small Bakemon board, like a, a less than ten dollar bo Bakemon board with plastic. And I read the explanation uh, uh, paper, and uh, yeah, I, I, I taught my friend uh, the rule. So we we both only knew the rule and started playing backgammon. Oh, that's and amazing. of course, it was not interesting at all. It's just a boring <laughs> game. Can you imagine? We only knew the rule. So how we enjoy backgammon? <laughs> no, no, no technique. Of course. I think that's such an amazing thing in so many places. Like people build up strategic understanding of the game without like any analysis and just play a ton. But I felt the same way when I learned the game. It's just like you roll dice and you move the checkers, like whatever. It's a simple game. <laughs> right? so, yeah. So, what so it, after we played like uh, five games, uh, we just quit. Oh, oh <laughs> it's it, it, not worth playing. <laughs> That's amazing. So what what changed? How did you figure out that it was a game worth playing and uh, studying? Then maybe I was seventeen years old. I accidentally found a book at the bookstore, which is a Bakemon strategy book. Okay, okay. Yeah, in in, in Japanese. Oh, cool. Yeah, and uh, I was wondering why there is a book. It's just a dice game. <laughs> so is there any strategy? That's what I thought. Oh, so incredible. I took the book and started reading. Oh, it seems very interesting. So I bought it. And I think I finished reading that book uh, in a day. Oh, wow. In what? one day, yeah. I have to know what book that was and who wrote it now. Oh, uh, so it is written uh, in Japanese. So sure. yeah, some Bakyamon freak uh, yeah, uh, wrote that book. Okay, like okay. A 200 pages book, yeah. Is it, uh, so I mean, maybe it's not translated to English or anything, but is it like, uh, I, I guess, like, would I know the name of the author if I had heard it? Is it someone that people have heard of? Is like uh, no. Author? Okay. No, not at all. Okay. But, but obviously, the Japanese author wrote uh, Paul Magri's book, Backgammon. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not a translation book, but uh, of course, that Japanese book is uh, strongly affected by Paul Magre's book. Okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never really thought about that. Was there like a, like a 1970s kind of era of backgammon players in Japan too, that like, like a pre-bot era of players that you ever got to meet or anything like that? Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, at the pre-bot era, yeah, we had some uh, uh, good players. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, Mr. Shimada. Uh, at that time, uh, no one wants to make the two point in the opening row 6-4. Mm -hmm. But uh, Mr. Shimada found out that uh, at some situation, uh, making a two point is a good choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what he found just by himself it was like a uh, late 70s wow wow okay okay that's yeah. uh that whole past era of backgammon is so impressive that like everyone 
had figured out one part of the game and they like were pretty sure about that and then maybe no one believed them and everyone had their other part that they had figured out right <laughs> and it's just incredible to think about and not being able to just go to a piece of software to just get the answer about all of it right <laughs> yeah uh i i believe you knew that yeah, uh, yeah. in old days uh people were laughing when the opponent made the two point in the opening row. Right, right, yeah. So you read this book, I guess, uh, what was the first piece of backgammon software you ever got to work with? Uh, it's uh, Expert Backgammon. Okay, okay, I haven't heard of that. Yeah, so late 90s. Okay, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah I bought that software and I bought a computer just for you for using that software wow wow that's awesome yeah <laughs> i still built my computer around running xg this most recent one <laughs> I had to make sure i had a processor that could keep up um but that's still how i'm thinking about it so is that around in like the 90s or 2000 when you wrote that first book in japanese too oh uh my japanese book yeah 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 i published it like uh 2002 okay okay something like that very cool and what was your first book yeah. about uh <laughs> it is about the, the five point match cube oh excellent okay okay so this is the one we're coming back to i'm so excited for that book to come out not only because yeah. i want to read all your books of course but I want you to be able to read my book and tell me if it's any good too. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, we we talked about that. Yeah. yeah. So last year, uh, <laughs> yeah, when I when I talked to you about my my new book, then you you told me, oh, you are also writing a, <laughs> a book about uh, Match Cube. So I was very much surprised. <laughs> yeah, I should have. I was looking on your website before doing this interview, and I saw you have it right in the schedule of books. And I just didn't know it. Someone had to tell me when I started talking about, like, I think I want to write a book on match score, and I had it, like, mostly done. They're like, oh, Michi's doing that, too. Oh, dang it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I, yeah. That's, that's super cool. That's, um, I guess, do you... Do you feel like your understanding of, of the five point match and match cubes has changed a lot in like those 20 years then? Like, are you finding you have to rewrite quite a bit of that book or is it still fundamentally uh, pretty similar? Of, of course, there's uh, some changes, but the, the main body is the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. cool. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you, I guess, is that still targeted for April this year too? Yes, yeah, but uh, now, of course, always uh, I, I, I'm, de uh, I'm a delay. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not sure, maybe 50 50, uh, I can publish in April or not. Oh, I got you. Okay, okay. Well, we'll get a date out once, uh, once you're sure of that. Then, very cool. So, the, the first book, too, I guess, well, I mean, it looks like all your English books that you've published have been through Amazon, right? You've just done it there? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, okay, okay. I'm so surprised by how easy that process is. Did you find, was it like pretty easy for you to figure that out too? Or did you need help publishing it? Or how did that come about? How did you realize that you could publish a book on Amazon? Oh, <laughs> of course, uh, it was my first time uh, uh, to use Amazon. So I was struggling. Yeah, I was struggling. Uh, is it easy for you? It was pretty easy. I just like downloaded oh. a template. And the first uh -huh. time I, like, I had images overlapping in margins in a way it didn't like. So I had to go, like, revise the draft. And that was, a, it was really annoying, but it wasn't difficult. <laughs> you know? Okay. Okay. <laughs> but once That's I nice. got there, like, the book was live kind of before. I thought I was just testing it out. And suddenly I had a book available for purchase on Amazon. I was like, like, it took like a day to get it up once I was ready to do that. So I was amazed by like how easy it was to get something up that way. Maybe it was harder still like five years ago. And I don't know, however long ago you published Opening Concepts, which I don't, how long has that been out now? Uh, no, uh, it it didn't uh, take a long time. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So it, maybe it's same as yours, but the, uh, for me, reading English is was not so easy. Oh, yeah. of course. And uh, yeah, 
Yeah, that's that's annoyed me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you work with uh, Roland Herrera, am I pronouncing his? Oh, yeah. Right? To like yeah. write all those too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how did you, how did that end up being like the writing relationship? And like, is he able to read Japanese or, or something? Or how did, like, how does that whole writing process work? Yeah, actually, uh, he he was a trigger. So Roland suggested me to publish a book in English. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, we collaborated and started writing uh, a new book. Yeah, uh, that book was uh, uh, totally new. And uh, but uh, maybe because I was too lazy, and so yeah, we wrote like uh, ten pages, twenty pages, but. At some point, uh, we stopped uh, mostly uh, because of my la my lazy activities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, maybe and then uh, after a while, uh, my Japanese friend Mr. Tanaka, uh, Tatsuya Tanaka, uh, told me maybe uh, you already wrote some books in Japanese, so translation will be much easier mm -hmm. to write a totally new book. So, oh, it sounds a great idea. And uh, now uh, I started uh, writing, uh, translating uh, my Japanese book about uh, uh, opening play. So that became uh, open concept, my first book. Oh, cool, cool. Okay, okay. Yeah. Awesome. I didn't realize that that one was one of your books that you had out in Japanese. And so you translated that, and then I presume you brought Roland in to like read through it and tell you how the translation was, basically, and like kind of bring good English to it or something. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. Okay. So originally, uh, that uh, there are two books about opening opening play. Mm -hmm. So I combine them, and uh, of course, uh, uh, some or many. Uh, changes was required and then I started a translation into English and uh, it is so difficult for me <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay and I finished that I pass it to Roran and uh, I, I believe uh, it was also very tough uh, work uh, to uh, change my English uh, yeah mm. yeah my my English PR is like uh, 15 so, <laughs> so Roland, <laughs> Roland tried to make it uh, like uh, 4 PR 3 PR English <laughs> oh nice okay 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 yeah I've seen the, the the progression in the in the English PR too though I think right like I feel like you're getting out there and just like speaking with people in videos way more often and it seems like I don't know. That's that's a good way to learn, I think. So <laughs> <laughs> that's super cool, man. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh... And also, uh, uh, Roland uh, had the idea. Uh, uh, how about uh, putting an illustration on the book? Putting a yeah. what on the book? Uh, 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 illust illustration. Oh, an illustration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. So this idea that. came from some uh, programming book, uh, which Roland Herrera read when he was young. Okay, okay. That programming book had many uh, cartoons, illustrations. Uh, so he loved that. Yeah, yeah. No, no. So okay. He suggested me to do that. Okay. <laughs> Sounds a good idea. And Roland uh, drew them by himself. <laughs> that's amazing i love that that's yeah super cool yeah i had no idea where no no came from okay i think you mentioned it in the first book or something but i had forgotten by now i feel like i read opening concepts so long ago you know <laughs> so it's not fresh <laughs> anymore yeah. i need a reminder that's super cool that's uh incredible stuff with that and it's just it's fascinating to me that that so presumably in Japanese or in like the like the Japanese players that have read your books have had this double tiger concept for for much longer than we have in the United States is what you're telling me exactly oh wow okay okay yeah <laughs> that's why a uh, Japanese player has the advantage yes yes absolutely 
<laughs> well, thank you for sharing that with all of us. I'm sorry if you don't have the same advantage anymore, you know. But uh, <laughs> I'm sure you'll find it in some other way. <laughs> I can't wait to see what other ideas come out too. So, so cool. The you're like so the English books that you have out are all of those like translated from ideas of books that you had in Japanese as well. Uh, yes. Uh, but uh, it's it's only about uh, the first book and the second book, Endgame Technique. Okay. So okay. my third book, Back Checker Strategy, is. Uh, totally new. Oh, cool. So I, I wrote it uh, from the scratch. Okay, okay, awesome, awesome. Yeah. Is that... So th that's why it was the most difficult book for me. Oh, I bet, I bet. It's super useful, too. And I enjoyed, I think when we talked about it, too, I forget, like, like we talked about sort of like why back checker strategy or like how it's organized. And I think you said something along the lines of like it should be like game plan strategy that you're really writing about or something like this yes that's right yeah yeah uh, originally the title was game plan yeah yeah so okay. i tried to write about uh, the game plan yeah uh, but uh, after uh, one year i found uh, the book will be very uh, big <laughs> maybe 100 uh, 500 pages <laughs> yes yes okay okay so uh, I actually Mart Marty Store he also suggested me yeah maybe game the title game plan is uh, yeah too big mm -hmm, yeah mm -hmm. so yeah. I try to narrow down the concept mm -hmm. and then I reach uh, to back checker very cool very cool I think um, the two go hand in hand so often right those are the maybe the strategically easiest game plan or back checker decisions are when a game plan calls for one of them clearly or something. Right. And like the others, I don't know. That makes perfect sense to me. Uh, you'd have a dilemma about yeah. what to call it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm running into something, maybe thinking about uh, writing more books too, about the same. I, I have like some idea what I'd write, like to write about, but whenever I like start getting organized on topics, it feels like it's going to be like a 5,000 page book or it could be too. Right. And like trying to hone in on one topic is very hard. Match play was very simple, you know, like that was very clear and contained. But then when I think about trying to write a book about evaluating positions for strategic concepts, like quickly, like what the, the first primary thing you should see might be. Yeah. It's hard to think about how to do that without it blowing up into all of backgammon. <laughs> very quickly so mm. yeah it's a real challenge you know <laughs> yeah yeah that's uh yeah so how did you find yourself like drawn to write about the five point match about openings and about end game technique early on in japanese like how did how did those topics come to you as things to write about uh okay uh the reason i i wrote about the five point match cube because that topic was super important for me at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I often play a five point match. Uh, we had a regular, uh, regular tournament in Osaka and in Tokyo uh, every Sunday. And uh, mostly we played the five point match. Mm -hmm. So uh, understanding the concept of the five point match cube is uh, was super important uh, uh, for, my, for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I found uh, uh, the idea is very different from money game. Mm, yeah. It's totally different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, if I knew the concept of the five-point match cube and the opponent doesn't know, my advantage is huge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I yeah, I studied, learned the five-point match cube uh, very deeply. So, yeah, for me, uh, writing about it was very natural. Okay, okay. So yeah. I, what I'm hearing yeah. is that probably the motivation for your books was some area of, like, honed-in study at the time. Like, you were really trying to... Is that how endgame technique came around, too? Like, you were really trying to figure out, how do I not make mistakes in this, like, barren and bear off anymore? And you came up with all your rules, and you're like, this feels like a book now. Yeah? Yeah. 
Uh, so in the middle of the game, the position is very complicated and uh, it's more difficult to find the best play. But uh, in in the bearing in bearing off, the position is more uh, it's simpler. So I, I I thought it's it's easier to find the best play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, uh, I think so too. I think so too. Yeah, so that's why. Uh, I tried to like a formula uh, in a bearing off, bearing in. Yeah. So once we uh, realize, understand, understand the formula, yeah, yeah, playing bearing in, bearing off will be easier. Yeah, that's so amazing. Cause I like, I, it feels like that should be true that it should be simpler. But for the longest time, like I just wouldn't understand. I didn't have names for the concepts, and I was making mistakes in Baron and Bear Off. I remember in a Shuat very early, like just bringing checkers in and having a spare ace to play. Um, in a Shuat, I just like played it in the outside, and my my partner in the Shuat was like, "I wish you would have slowed down and let me think about the ace. I think we should have played like the spare from the six to the five. And I was just like, why did why would that matter? Who cares? What do you, <laughs> you know? And I looked it up later, and like by a very small margin, that was right. I was like, why does this guy know this? And like, how does like I didn't? There was nothing logical about it to me. And I think like the Ooh. same with your mountain structure against the ace point and all this too. They're all things that, I mean, I found your book so like that end game technique particularly, like they're just all concepts that still I guess they're starting to make sense now that I've seen them enough. But but I was just never going to sort that or, like, organize it out on my own. I don't know. I found that to be so difficult. And just, like, the shortcut of your book was huge for me. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure. Yeah. So uh, believe me, still I made uh, many mistakes in bearing in, bearing off. Yes, it's never a uh, stop. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, even so, yeah, uh, still, I can say, yeah, bearing in is, uh, yeah, we can understand, we can, yeah, yeah, yeah we can solve, uh, yeah, compared to the middle game. Right, right. Some of those are very difficult, right? That's I've I've found a lot of utility in teaching lessons too about, I guess in some sense, the early game is almost like the most complicated or the most strategic. There's always like you have so long to go that maybe plays run closer and you can get away with a lot, but but seeing why you would do one thing or the other, it's hardest to teach to like a new person, maybe. And then in the middle game, you're starting to get into like some clear strategic concepts and like really making a choice between like racing or attacking or priming. And it's still difficult to choose which one of those to do. And there's a lot of tactics that are starting to show up too. And by the end of the game, it does feel like it gets into the, just this like pure calculation a lot of times, right? Like I, my opponent has a five point board. I can't afford to be hit. So I have to count how often I'm going to be hit and do the one that gets hit the least. Right. And, and it's something kind of like this and it, it has a natural flow that way too. Um, so I think like the middle game can be complicated to figure out, but I, I don't know if that makes it, it's interesting to me that it almost like the early game is probably the hardest to teach to me. I don't know if you've found that or like in writing your books, do you like, how do you think about it from a teaching perspective? Which one's the hardest for you to teach? Oh, uh, by far a middle game is the hardest for me. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And what kind of middle game decisions do you think are like the hardest to understand and the hardest to teach as well? <laughs> uh, probably uh, a checkup plays in the priming game. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah priming you. battle. Yeah. Yeah. This can be very hard. Yeah. I remember you showed me uh, an interesting, like priming or blitzing kind of move in in Monte Carlo too. I can't remember what it was. the The one feature I remember is that you had the bar point and the ace point made, and so I like pointed to an attacking play. And and I remember you mentioned I, that you recognize that as an attacking structure, but still found it difficult or whatever. But yeah, these concepts are all very tricky. I don't know, but that's super cool. <laughs> yeah. So 
So I can teach only uh, what I understand. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Probably my understanding in the priming battle is weak, so I cannot teach them. Sure. Sure. I I do like that too, though. I can teach. I can teach more than I can play over the board, if that makes sense. I think I can like rationalize and come up with what's happening in XG with almost like with any play, but that doesn't mean that I can actually make that play in a tournament, right? And so there's like a little mm -hmm. bit of a difference there for me. Um, yeah, yeah. I remember talking a little bit about your path forward too. Do you still teach a lot of lessons or keep students or are you trying to get away from that? Uh, yeah, uh, I continue to uh, teach, uh, especially online, yes. Yeah, but uh, in the future, uh, I I want to uh, stop uh, teaching uh, a private private lessons. Uh, yeah, yeah, I want to stop it in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, right now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I guess why is that? Well, like, what what direction are you trying to go with that? Uh, because because we have many uh, technologies now, so. So private wrestling is not so effective, uh, in my opinion. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. We can uh, we can teach to uh, many people at the same time. Yeah, using the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I want to find a, a more effective way. Yeah, because my life is not very long. <laughs> <laughs> life is short. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mess around with that in my head too about like group lessons or something. I really liked the Denyek's doing uh, the the like online video courses. I think is really cool. So there's a lot of like oh, creative yeah. creative solutions that way. I guess have you thought of anything like that that you really want to like take a shot at? Like uh, are either of those or some other method that you want to try to go for? Uh, so Zdenik Zizka. Yeah, he made a lot of videos, uh, video lesson course. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this is, I, I believe it's one of the best way to teach because uh, so many people can access uh, that video. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe it's more effective. Yeah. And so you mentioned a lot more focus on your YouTube channel too. Like, um, what do you... I guess do you have any like what what are your goals for for reach with that and is that do you see that as like uh I guess that's going to help you sell books maybe not as much like teach lessons or something but like what's your do you do you think sometime YouTube itself will just be like bringing in money or or what's what's your plan with that what are you trying to do there uh uh the motivation I started uh Posting a video on my YouTube channel is that I want I want to promote my books. Yeah, that's uh, my strong motivation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I believe uh, it is working well. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Through my YouTube channel, uh, people uh, knew. Oh, uh, Michi published a book. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. Uh, the the bigger uh, objective is uh, just promote Bakyama is uh, yeah our ult ultimate goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, this... yeah. Big. Be <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, because Go. this game is so fascinating. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I wanna uh, more people enjoy playing Bakyama. Yeah, yeah. I like that. I think um, the YouTube channel and all the commentary that I do as well. Like, it's so funny. It's almost like it's it's helping me with my book that I have out for sure. You know, like it's like a platform for being able to do that. But it also, like, I still want to write books. But but it's interesting that it makes me feel like I really should write books because that's like the one, like the one money reason I have to do YouTube videos and stuff like that. Right? <laughs> like this is the real thing that actually like turns into something and lets me keep focusing on backgammon so now there's like pressure to write a book even though i kind of just want to make youtube videos <laughs> so so i don't know i'm trying to figure that out um it's funny to hear with you too you know um but yeah i'm curious what you think about like expanding the game and in like more youtube content creators and things like that 
I don't know. Like, how do you think we get out, get more people interested in playing backgammon? Uh, just, just by myself, uh, I'm not sure what I can do it. But, uh, for example, uh, some people are doing pretty well. Uh, let's say uh, Patrick in Dubai. Mm. He, yeah, he he published a company uh, to run backgammon event. I I th I believe he is the only person in the world who published a company to run backgammon event. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he's he's doing pretty well. Yeah. He may start. Uh, teaching backgammon in school in Dubai. Oh, wow. Okay, teaching in school as well. Yeah. This is such a cool idea yes. I've heard. I know Mochi does like the camps with the kids in Japan, but I've, I've heard about, I mean, art right. in yeah. here in the States like teaches some courses kind of around that, but not directly. I know Phil Simborg's been really interested in that too. But yeah, like no one's really cracked into like, making backgammon like popular as a course in university or something like that. But I love that idea. It's like the right age of people to get engaged with the game, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I yeah, I love to help Patrick. So maybe yeah, uh I I may teach uh, backgammon in Dubai. <laughs> oh wow. Okay, okay. So you might be looking for teachers. Uh, I've got to talk to him. <laughs> I'll come move to Dubai <laughs> with you. <laughs> Uh, of course, everything is un unclear, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I believe Patrick is uh, working on the right direction. Oh, that's so cool. That's uh, I've met him a couple times at tournaments, and he wants to talk to me about like some of his ideas, too. Um, I didn't know about uh, the teaching, though. That's really cool. Maybe he's someone I need to like do an interview with on here as well, and, like let people know what he's doing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. To me, I feel like there's a lot of YouTube content being created out there right now around backgammon. And it's like this this moment where you can get out to people very easily, right? And I think that that has the potential to connect with a bit bigger audience around like UBC and things like that. So it feels like I can do my small piece just like trying to get everyone talking to each other and working with each other. Um, but yeah, I was curious what other like if you have any like pet vision projects of your own to get out to more people that you want to work on, or if it's just having like a giant YouTube channel and being a, a hub that way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you, you mentioned UBC. Yeah. Uh, I believe UBC is uh, uh, the best successful uh, online event uh, ever. Yeah. Yeah. It's super cool yeah. how engaged people are with that. Yeah. Yeah, many of my uh, Japanese friends uh, watch the videos. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I, it's, I guess I did like a little commentary before that, but that's mostly how I got started doing it, right? And uh, it's amazing to me how many people just like try to listen to that to get a grasp on the game and like, yeah, do get do get interested in strategy from it, right? Like it's it's a place that they can start. I'm always curious how to bridge that gap too. I think like right now I've got an idea to, to like on YouTube, introduce people to XG as well. I don't know when this will come out. I'll probably have videos out about that already. But but all these things are just kind of, I don't, like when I make YouTube videos, I guess all my friends in the backgammon world are pretty studied and like deep into the game. But I try to remember that I'd also like people that haven't played before to like be able to take interest and learn something from it, you know? Um, so I'm always thinking about, like, what do I need to communicate for for someone new to be like engaged with this too? You know, is that is that who you're trying to get to with your YouTube channel too, or do you want to be more like speaking to experienced backgammon players, or how do you think about that? Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, yeah, so I I want to try uh, many things because uh, still. Uh, I'm not sure what is the best way. So uh, yeah, if uh, people suggest me to do something, oh, uh, I want to take any ideas. Yeah, if there are the good possibilities. Oh, I love it. Okay, okay, that's awesome. Yeah, maybe, um, 
Maybe more named position videos. Just see a bunch of that <laughs> concept <laughs> videos. Quickies on that. That'd be cool. Well, awesome, man. It's yeah. uh, that's super cool. I'm excited to see your your match play book when it comes out. I really appreciate. It. I mean, I love seeing how much you've been putting out there on YouTube too. I know you have a ton of like match play videos where you talk about your thinking process and you've been having other people on. I am going to do that with you either. Again, I so I told you I schedule these out. So this might not come out till like a couple weeks after whenever we actually play our match together or something. I don't know. <laughs> so timelines will be silly. But uh, yeah, I mean, everyone should go over there and check that out on your YouTube channel if you haven't already. And of course, all Michi's plans and books are on his website, which I have up there too. Um, yeah, is there anything else you wanted to share before we wrap this up? Yeah, so uh, Nick, I really appreciate uh, what you contributed to the Bakyamon world. Yeah, you made uh, lots of videos and uh, you gave commentary on UBC and uh, so many uh, tournaments. Yeah, yeah, I believe, uh, yeah, your effort uh, yeah, enhances Bakyamon world. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. It's... Uh... It's cool. I mean, I just got started doing that because it was a fun thing to do, you know, and I just like had a different idea about like I said, like, I guess my idea of like who I'm talking to with commentary is just different than what it's been with other people. And I don't like I'm just amazed how many people that's like resonated with and that's just turned into it took a couple of years. But then all of a sudden I was like meeting people that had watched UBC before at tournaments. Um, so it's just kind of all come about suddenly this year, which is really cool for me too. So yeah, thank you. I appreciate everyone that like l helps me keep doing that, you know, so that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. We've got a match to play and talk about. So, so yeah, yeah, we'll wrap it up here. Thanks so much for being on Michi. Um, I'll be on your channel sometime soon or in the past, however it works out. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'm sure I'll see you sure. in a tournament again someday soon. Uh, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks Michi for joining me and bye for now. <laughs> bye for now.